Well, I think that any inspiration that stems from our relationship is a positive thing. So I like that. I like that, yeah, it shows up from time to time in both of our films. But uh, as far as clearing the air, <laughs> like, <laughs> like getting the story straight, um, it wasn't about... <laughs> It wasn't about just like wanting, a lot of the interviews are like, she wanted to leave Texas and move to LA and like, don't know to LA. Like, no, like we had a shitty house here and it was kind of run down and crappy. He was leaving for a year to do post-production in, in Los Angeles and I'm like, why are we hanging on to this rental house when I could come with you and we could be together and he was just like, I just don't want to lose our house. I'm like, so crappy like let's just get a new house when we get back and and then we ended up finding an amazing house when we got back and everything was fine but yeah it's, it wasn't like I just hate Texas I want to leave it was like I want to be with you I want to be together while you're living in LA and and we'll find a new place exactly yeah <laughs> I wish you were around for all the Q&A's <laughs> awesome. uh, when we talked a couple of weeks ago after the Oak Cliff Film Festival uh, closing night screening of this film, we we got to talking about a couple of the themes, and the main ones being love, loss, legacy. But the one that stuck out the most to me was about the idea of creativity and that nothing belongs to you. And where does that creativity come from? Because specifically, there's that scene where Casey creates that song, the, the the wonderful "I Get Overwhelmed by Dark Rooms," who also composed your film, Daniel Hart. Yeah. He creates that song, and then later on in the film, where we see the young settler, like the little girl, she's humming that very same song. It's very subtle, you can hardly tell, but I picked up on yeah. it, and I'm glad that I was able to kind of discuss that with you. And so, and then on top of that, she hides her a note underneath the rock, and so there's just so many things that kind of connect to that conversation that that prognosticator has. Yeah. And so, like, what were your intentions with showing us those visuals, and what do you hope that audiences will take away from those things? I mean, I kind of wanted to remove the preciousness from things that are incredibly precious to us. And so the idea there is, you know, he's hearing a melody that he probably thought was his own, and it's, it's not. It's just a couple notes that someone else probably sang once before. And the same thing with the note under the rock. It's just like another secret that matters to somebody else, and, and that he'll never know the answer to, and, and he has to be okay with that. So. I like, you know, the, lo the, the movie is a largely about letting go of, you know, of preciousness, whether that's nostalgia or physical things or a combination of the two. And so those, those are just little, like, signifiers that kind of point the audience in that direction. Maybe on a subconscious level, because not everyone picks up on that, that melody that she's humming, but that was, that was you know, the inten intention there. Right, right. And uh, before I op open it up to the audience, I got to ask the obvious question that you've probably been asked a hundred times, and that's the pie sequence. Mm -hmm. And because I can't tell you how much I heard about this pie sequence out of Sundance, and all my friends who saw it there were coming back, and they're telling me so much about this sequence because it's it's like three to five minutes long to see uh, Rooney eat mm -hmm. all that pie which is from Spiral Diner, the, the vegan chocolate pie. And I know you got your friend here that is behind that. And so, um, did you expect to, for it to have that traction, for it to blow up to this point where that's like one of the few main things that people talk about after they see Yeah, I mean, there, there was no way that we would have been like just completely oblivious if we hadn't like expected that. We hoped that the scene would work, and that if it, we knew that if it worked, it would overcome any sort of expectations. And so it was, it felt safe for it to become a touchstone or for it to be a talking point because people will go see the movie and they'll probably at this point know that that's gonna happen and there will be a certain degree of anticipation. And then like a minute and a half, two minutes into the scene, they're like, oh, this is still going on. <laughs> it's just, it's happening. And, and, and there's nothing, and then all the expectations are just like, you know, you just set them aside and you have to just engage with that scene because there's not, it's not sensational. You know, all of the expectations, I imagine, probably, you know, allow you to kind of like expect something a little bit more sensational. It's not, it's just uncomfortable and private and a scene that you normally wouldn't see in a movie, nor is it a scene that you should be seeing because it's a private moment for this character. And it, and it, it breaks through the artifice of the rest of the movie because it really is just happening. It's happening in front of you for four and a half minutes and you just have to deal with that and 
and however you're going to deal with it. And so I was okay with it becoming, I mean, I'm sure like two weeks from now it's going to be like a meme on the internet. It probably already is. <laughs> and that's fine because like the movie is still the movie and that scene is still serving its purpose in the, in the, in the movie. And, and as far as I'm concerned, it does work. It does work exactly as we intended it to. And, and because it does, I think it overcomes whatever trivialization might occur as people, you know, talk about it, look forward to it, make GIFs on the internet, et cetera, et cetera. Right, because you leave so much open that we can project so much of our, so much of ourselves on screen to kind of fill, fill in these voids, and so yeah, that's great. That's what makes this the great experience that it is, that, so I can go home and sleep on it and continually thinking about it. That, those are the kind of movies that I appreciate, and so thank you. Thank you. So, say for you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to... Uh, um, Give a shout out to Johnny Marshall who did our sound design and mixing. Oh, is he? I didn't know that. Yeah, All right. So, does anybody have a question? You right there. Hi. Sorry. A little nervous. Uh, honestly, the entire time I was watching the movie, the, the idea of what is tangible was like through my head the entire time because it's like almost frustrating he wants to reach out and touch and you make it really visceral like the inability to be able to do that but what's interesting to me is more like as far as emotionally goes like the entire like idea of people wanting to be able to emotionally be tangible like reach out physically and that's something that's frustrating and something that we can't really control. And my question, and it's gonna be funny to you, is because you obviously have great control over the idea of like actual medium and then emotional and all those things. So all this like feelings like grief, loss, whatever. But my question to you is, what are like your top three like favorite things, like happiest things. <laughs> like in general? Yeah, in general. I just like, I, I've always wanted to ask the director who knows these kind of things, like just all these medium, really honestly, like what are three things that make you happy? Can I answer four? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, let's see, let's see how. Like I really honestly always want to know what a director who I really respect and admire and like have just like, the ability to be able to express these things. I always want to know, just like, what are these, <clears throat> on top of your head, like, yeah. three coffee. happy, okay, <laughs> coffee. Cozy things. Cozy things. And, um, cozy things. and um, a combination of the two. <laughs> I mean, that's the like, first thing that comes off the top of my head. Of, All like, right, things yeah, that that's perfect. But, but those are like very, like, ephemeral things. Like, can, so many things can apply to them. Absolutely. I mean, that's what's perfect about it. It's I probably should have said August, I mean, but she, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's very cozy. You left your wife out of it, but that's cool, too. <laughs> All right, I just always wanted to ask that question. I, I, I probably, you know, could, it's not the best answers, but those are the first things that came to my mind. No, those are They do make me very happy. Perfect. Oh, yeah, you're in there. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, another one? You, sir. Um, cool. Um, well, first off, wow, this movie is incredible. Uh, it's my favorite movie that I've seen this year. Thank you. I'm a self-proclaimed movie buff, whatever that means. Um, but my question to you is, I didn't know until tonight that you've actually worked with Rooney and Casey as a pair together um, on a film before. Obviously, I haven't seen it yet because I just found that out. But really excited to see it at some point. But I was just wondering, with this movie, since you worked with them before and the film was pretty successful, were you thinking of them when you were in the pre-production stage for this? Or was it just like, oh, my pals Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara, can you please be on this project? It was a little bit of, of both because I wanted to make this movie entirely with friends. I didn't want to have, um, you know, have to try to convince strangers to you know, embark upon this bizarre journey. So I, you know, the, the familiarity that we already had with each other was helpful. That just made everything easier. They trusted me already. 
they were willing to just come hang out in Irving, Texas for a summer and, and, uh, and not tell anybody. And, but the, the other thing that was important was that they have very little screen time in the movie before, you know, Casey gets covered in a bed sheet. And I wanted to make sure they felt like a real couple and that they had a sense of like, you know, that you, that you believe that they love one another. And the chemistry that they have is phenomenal. And that's something we learned on the first movie together. We learned that if you put the two of them on screen together, you just want more of the two of them. They're really, really good together. And the first movie we made with them, originally we had like two scenes with them and they were apart for the entire movie. And as soon as we got them on screen together and we're shooting, we're like, we need to write more scenes because they're so good together. It was really, it really kind of changed that movie and made it far more romantic than it was intended to be. And I wanted that same thing to happen here. I wanted that romanticism that they can bring to that relate their relationship. Uh, I wanted that to you know infuse the movie. So it was both of the reasons. You. Uh, I've got two questions. One is kind of a brief. All right. Um, I've got two questions. One's kind of brief, but like nuts and bolts. The interior of that business, um, the business yeah. building, is that that place off 75? I like yeah, the city <laughs> place. Okay, I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the risk of like sounding like I'm trivial trivializing your movie by putting it in the context of other stuff, I was just curious if there are any directors other than Malik, which seems kind of obvious, I guess, or movies. No, never mind. Not obvious. Or, Go outside and shoot a movie in Texas at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. It's going to feel like Terrence Malick movie. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, that trivializes your question because like, there is like connections to Tree of Life, certainly. But other directors that we were thinking about were as, you know, as, you know, artsy as a peach upon beer, Seth Lickle and the Sai Ming Lang, both of whose films I learned about here in this theater, oddly enough. And, uh, I remember saying, what time is it there? Back in like 2002 and maybe 2003. And that had a huge impact on me and that runs through and through this movie. And then uh, Chantelle Ackerman's Jean Dielman, all of her movies really were a, a, a big inspiration, but also Steven Spielberg. I mean, there's a, a playfulness to every Spielberg movie, not just Poltergeist, which we were directly citing multiple times in this movie, but I wanted this movie to be playful. And I always like think about him when I'm trying to do that because he, no matter what he's making, is, has this ability to infuse a playfulness to his approach to cinema. And that's something that as austere or, you know, still as this movie might be at times, we still wanted it to have a playfulness. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll do you first. First of all, I just have an appreciation that you film throughout Dallas, throughout Fort Worth. This is a really interesting time and place to be filming a ghost story. Right now, we have so much um, industrialization, uh, knocking down of whole neighborhoods, towns. Um, my aunt herself, she had a, a very well-known house in her neighborhood, bright pink, and it got someone bought her property and knocked it down. Now there's just a gaping hole there, and that is seems to be the landscape throughout the area. So right now there do seem to be a lot of weird ghosts of the old parts of towns, the parts that used to be empty, and now there's something new there, a road, um, an office building or something. And it reminded me of your scene where uh, Casey gets very angry and, and you know throws the plates and stuff and I think a lot of people in Dallas kind of feel that way right now a kind of um, feeling incensed but also realizing that you have to let go and move on but my other question was how did you get all of the um, product placements for this movie I noticed uh, the temptress right away <laughs> Um, on the counter somewhere, Tito's, a, a few other uh, local... Someone here, someone here could probably answer that question better yeah. than I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, William Sidney. <laughs> we have this, how old was he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, no, we had a great, we had a, he's amazing, he's worked with these guys, and he, uh, I mean, he just reached out to people, he's got a whole catalog of people that he reaches out to, and 
Um, I think that you know most of it came through that. Um, U hauls in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the Tito's. I didn't notice I the Tito's too. Yeah, but, but yeah, the Tito's. Yeah, coffee. What was the coffee? Oh, tweet. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Tweet coffee. Yeah. You just ask. It's easy. No, there's no sponsors. Oh, but it they was just by providing stuff. <laughs> it's just nice to see familiar products that aren't so big, but I like that it also felt like a different kind of ghost in the movie, like getting deja vu, seeing something that out of context that you're not expecting to see, and then it sparks something inside of you, and you go, oh yeah, you have an emotion tied to it. Wonderful. All right, so thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. You're right here in the middle. Sorry, I had a question too, real quick, since I'm sitting right here. Do you mind if yeah, I've, go for I've been it, go for it. Here. while the mic is being passed? Thank you. Okay. No, all the way in the back. There's someone who's hold, the gentleman who's holding the microphone. Yes. What do you suspect may have happened had uh, Casey not jumped off the building? I think uh, it would have kept going in that direction, and we would have had to uh, figure out what happens in the future. <laughs> not go <obviously> see Dunkirk. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it just would have kept going. It would have been like, I mean, more like, maybe it'd be more like a Valerian on another movie open this weekend. And then it would have turned, then it would have turned into Mad Max, and, and uh, we, stopped, we stopped at Blade Runner, though. There was like this entire sequence that what it did that did turn into Valerian, but we just scrapped it. Thank you. So you someone else has the microphone at the moment. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, I am so drawn to your films. I think they're amazing. Um, Ain't the Body Saints was like so incredible to me. And um, you have such a way of kind of being different outside of the genre and kind of reinventing these ideas. Like a suicidal ghost is not something <laughs> I expected to see on the screen tonight. Um, I guess my question, something that stands out to me in your films is like this um, really like palpable intimacy that you can feel and I know you kind of touched on it with working with Rooney and Casey mm -hmm. before um, but I guess how do you how do you um, kind of create that intimacy or, or what do your actors bring or what does your team bring to have that be so um, understandable and like in your face and in your films I mean the most I can say is that I just try to strip stuff away that might get in the way of that intimacy because that always matters to me like that's something that really matters to me and those are the moments in my movies that i'm always usually the happiest with when it feels like there's something truly sincere occurring between two people or even if it's just one person but nonetheless having like those, those those intimate moments uh really are one of the reasons i make movies and it's definitely the actors a lot of the time and it's also the cinematographer and, and, and the entire crew just working to kind of create a space where you can capture that. But it does all start with the screenplay and trying to, you know, get to the heart of the matter of every any given scene and get rid of all of the stuff that might clutter it and get in the way. So all of my movies are usually, on a narrative level, very, very simple. Like there's never like crazy twists or turns. There's nothing too, you know, out there that ever happens. I mean, setting aside the fact that this is a movie about a ghost and all that, but uh, it's always pretty cut and dry in terms of like the the literal progression of the narrative. But because I do that, I do that on purpose. And the reason I do it is because then you can kind of zoom in on these other moments that really matter to me and hopefully resonate with other people as well. That that that's the stuff that I take away from the movie. So I want the story to get out of the way so you can just set it aside and kind of move in for these these intimate moments that really, to me, are what the movie's about. And I mean that for all my movies. Like, Pete's Dragon, the best parts of those movies are the ones where it's just like two characters having a heart to heart, and sometimes one of those characters is a giant CG dragon. But nonetheless, it's, it's just two characters having a moment together. And those are the, the, that dynamic, that, you know, intimacy, when you can get it truly on a, with, with the appropriate amount of honesty and sincerity, I think really is, is special. And I always, I'm always aspiring to capture that. Thank you. Thank you. You right here? I like the fact that the Hispanic family, you didn't try to put any subtitles mm -hmm. while they were going on, because the whole, fa the whole purpose was the reaction of the ghost in there. Mm -hmm. But then when the ghosts saw each other, you gave subtitles. Yeah. And th that wasn't even necessary, because when they looked at each other, I was thinking what you put on the screen. 
<laughs> so it, it was great because you wouldn't even be. Oh, thank you. Like, yeah, initially in the script, it didn't have the subtitles there. And I, just, I wasn't ready for that scene to end yet because it was so nice to see him finally connect with somebody. <laughs> like, he was like trying so hard and finally he was able to like be acknowledged by, by someone else. And so we just wanted that scene to keep going. And the subtitles just felt like a natural way to do it. And then I, I, I love that the sequence in, in Spanish isn't subtitled. And if you, if you speak Spanish, you can follow it. And, and what they're saying does you know, matter. But also, it doesn't matter so much that you're missing anything. And there's a great beauty to the language if you're just listening to it in, you know, on a, on a sensorial level. And I love that. I love just being able to listen to what they're saying. And you could say it's from the ghost point of view, too, because like he, you know, let's just say he doesn't speak Spanish, so he doesn't know what they're saying. And, uh, and so it functions on that level, but just as a, as a you know, tonal thing. Like, it's such a beautiful thing to just be able to listen to it, divorced of the meaning. And I, I really appreciate that myself. Just directing them, you know, I, I did not speak Spanish nearly well enough to actually direct them in Spanish. So I was just really, even though I wrote all the dialogue, just focusing on the emotions and the sounds of, of the scenes. And that was a really wonderful experience for me as a director. That's great. I also like the fact that the two ghosts had different sheets on. They were with a sheet that covered them up when they died. So. Well, yeah, we called, we called that ghost the, the grandma ghost. <laughs> That's good, yeah. Got time for about two more. You're on the end. How was shooting the movie locally compared to shooting films elsewhere? As far as like, what does it give the movie, you know, a tone and design that you might not get somewhere else? Well, there's, there, there, there's, it's again working with friends, working with you know, people you know makes it comfortable, and also shooting in your own backyard is very comfortable. You're able to just feel at home, you know the place. We just shot a movie a couple months ago in Cincinnati and that was a wonderful experience, but we still had to spend time getting to know the place and finding locations and, and just understanding what it was we were actually getting on film versus making a movie like this where we are able to you know, write it to locations we know or write it to a geography that we're familiar with and it just makes everything more personal because you just know that space, you know that landscape, you know how to capture it on film. Also. I can work with far more friends here because they all live here. And when you're out of town, you, have, you can't afford to bring everybody out. And so getting to come make a movie here is wonderful because I can just really literally surround myself with friends. And there's so many great filmmakers here, so many great uh, people to work with. And it was really a joy to actually finally get to work with them after having made a few movies out of state. All right, last one. All right, you sir, right there. Thank you. Uh, love, love the movie. Thank Just you. Really uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. I, I, uh, I'm curious about comparing your ghost to ghosts that have been in other movies that indicate uh, or show a spirit that's wandering the world after death. And, uh, you know, Pastor Patrick Swayze. Uh, yep. And, uh, Rest in uh, peace. The ghost, in, the ghost in Mrs. Muir. The, yeah. Uh, actress. Beetlejuice. Lived in Dallas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, and you're portraying uh, an afterlife. Okay. And uh, it's tongue in cheek, and I love the way the ghost was portrayed. I just, I just thought that was terrific. But I'm curious about your idea and your thoughts, and maybe your personal belief in afterlife? I am open to anything, really, but I don't have any expectations. And I didn't want the movie to feel prescriptive in any way. I didn't want to say, like, here is what I believe. Here is, here is what I believe will happen. We, you know, I didn't want this to feel literal in that sense, in terms of its representation of any particular set of beliefs or any, set, any, any type of faith. And, and in so much as it's not meant to be taken that way, it's not reflective of what I believe. And what I believe is something I'm still processing and searching for, and, and I don't want to foist that search on anybody else, but I wanted this movie to be inclusive of what anyone else might want to bring to it. I didn't want to exclude anybody. I never wanted to feel like this was a rejection of any ideas or beliefs or a movie that purported to be the antithesis of any set of beliefs or any particular faith or not or, or lack thereof. So the movie is very open in that regard and it doesn't mirror my own personal belief system, but 
it definitely comes from me. So there's, it's, even though it doesn't reflect that, it's still very personal in, in, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good, good, good final question, if that was the last question. I have one. Oh, great. Okay. This is for all of y'all. So when I grew up, I always was fascinated with history and my attachment to my town, which I grew up in, was Denton, Texas. And so to be on the square and see the courthouse, and I'm so fascinated to go into the coffee shops and open up the books and see old pictures and just see how it was. And I wish so much that I could just sit there and just watch everything change from the beginning that it started and then where it's going to end up. And so I'm curious for the, each of you who want to participate in this question, outside of just your house that you had with your wife, like what part, like what place would you be most interested in seeing the history of? Oh, that's a tough, tough question. Like in Texas or in general? Any, anywhere, anywhere that you have an attachment to. Anybody else want to tackle that one first? <laughs> I'd be really interested in seeing the history of the earth. <laughs> just watch the beginning of Tree of Life, there you go. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Anywhere I am, I'm interested in that. I mean, I think it's a very general <clears throat> curiosity. Um, but it is, I grew up in Fort Worth, and, and it is interesting to every once in a while drive through my old neighborhood where I grew up and see how it's changed, how the, how the house I grew up in is a different color, how they tore down the garage and all that kind of stuff. And um, it's always... It's always nice to um, revisit the physicality of a place and the one thing that can, you know, that can never change is what you remember it, whether it's right or wrong. You know, memories aren't very reliable, but um, it is nice to, to have a physical place for those. Yeah, I think uh, if, I just li I like looking at those books that show you. Um, the history of a city or a neighborhood and just like year by year you flip through and it never it doesn't matter you know what city it is they're always fascinating to watch that sense of progress so i kind of feel like anywhere would be great if you had the ability it wouldn't really matter like so let's set aside the fact that that's that, that means like that's pretty cool that you can just sit there and watch history progress like that's like any, anywhere would be great like uh, but i don't yeah there's places that are personal to me but uh I wouldn't limit it to that. Once you're watching uh, history progress from an omniscient point of view, it's like, show me anything. That's pretty cool. We live in an old house, and like our bathroom is a real mess. And this bastard, somebody just put a hole in the floor. I don't want to know who or why they did that. <laughs> That's better. Great. All right. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, we have one? 10 copies of the soundtrack to give out. And we couldn't figure out what we should do to give them out, so we're just gonna throw them out. <laughs> one at a time, like a ninja star, and trying to hurt them. No, if you come up to, if you, we we're trying to get the word out with this movie because even though it's you know playing at this theater and we're excited to, that it's opening across the country, it's still like it's a tiny movie and needs a lot of support. And so if you post about it on social media right now and show that to us, first ten people to do it will give you a copy of the soundtrack. Oh. Is that hashtag the ghost story? Hashtag the ghost story. Whatever.